I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As anyone can plainly see, we are living in the last moments before the return of Jesus Christ. America is in a spiritual battle between good and evil, as we read in Ephesians 6.12. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In August, Lloyd Austin came up with a new political purity test. This one was specifically designed to separate the obedient from the free. Can't have any of the latter category. Austin said he planned to fire anyone in the entire armed services who would not submit to the COVID-19 vaccination shot. Didn't matter whether they had natural immunity or not, as many in the military do. Their personal, moral, or religious objections were totally irrelevant. The point was to bow before his authority and the authority of the Democratic Party. No excuses, no exceptions. Quote, I have determined, Austin said, that mandatory vaccination against COVID-19 is necessary to protect the force and defend the American people. Period. No debate. So what's the scientific justification for this? Well, of course, there isn't any. There is zero scientific basis for any of this. The fighting strength of the military is young, healthy people, virtually all of them at extremely low risk of dying from COVID. In fact, to this day, only 46 members of the entire U.S. military have died from the coronavirus over the last year and a half. Suicides, by contrast, kill many, many times more. In just a few months last year, 156 servicemen killed themselves. So military suicide is an actual crisis that the Pentagon might want to address. Lloyd Austin might want to look into that. But no, that would get the Democratic Party nothing. The point of mandatory vaccination is to identify the sincere Christians in the ranks, the free thinkers, the men with high testosterone levels, and anyone else who does not love Joe Biden and make them leave immediately. It's a takeover of the U.S. military. Here's how they're doing it. This show has just obtained a PowerPoint that the army is using to justify mandatory vaccines to the troops. This is an actual slide from it on your screen. You will notice there the sympathetic portrayal of Satanism. How many children were sacrificed to Satan because of the vaccine? The slide reads apparently sarcastically. Then the pres presentation proceeds to list the so-called tenets of Satanism, which are taken straight from the Temple of Satanism website. So here you have the United States Army doing PR for Satanism. Satan is working overtime as he knows he has but a short time as we read in Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Whether the secularists and progressives know it or not, they are of their father the devil. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The rest of the presentation is less shocking than that, but it's utterly shoddy and dishonest. For example, it falsely claims that only three people have died from taking the COVID vaccine. Reports collected by the Biden administration itself indicate that number is actually in the thousands. So we called the army about this today, and they can see that the PowerPoint you just saw is absolutely real. Troops saw it but it was somehow not approved by army, le army leadership. They did not explain how that works or what they're going to do about it. We do know the vaccine mandate is taking a terrible toll on the US military and on this country's ability to defend itself at a very volatile time in the world. Already three members of the CIA paramilitary teams that first entered Afghanistan after 9-11, remember them? They got there before the military. Three members of that team have been suspended for not getting vaccinated. They're being told to await disciplinary proceedings. Meanwhile, an Army officer, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Douglas Haig, just announced that he's resigning from the military rather than take medicine that he does not want or need. In a statement, Haig said he was, quote, incapable of injecting myself, subjecting myself to the unlawful, unethical, immoral, and tyrannical order to sit still and allow a serum to be injected into my flesh against my will and better judgment, end quote. There are many like him in the U.S. military. 
The Navy is to inform the most famous unit in the entire services, the Navy SEALs, that members will be forced to leave if they don't take the shot. It does not matter if they have natural immunity, and many do. It doesn't matter if they have a valid religious or medical exemption. If they don't submit to the order, they cannot deploy and they'll have to leave the SEALs. The deadline for this is almost immediately. Now, to be clear, just in case you're wondering if this is in response to some kind of crisis, we don't believe a single Navy SEAL has died of COVID, and that makes sense. These are some of the healthiest people, not just in America, but in the world. They're the Olympic athletes of the military. Many of them have had the virus, they live in close quarters, and they've recovered. That means they have more natural immunity than the vaccine could ever provide. And yet, as of tonight, we're hearing that hundreds of Navy SEALs face being fired imminently for refusing to take the shot. Now, keep in mind, there are only about 2,500-ish active duty Navy SEALs. Each one of them costs at least a half a million dollars for the U.S. government to train. So imagine the effect on our country's military readiness. It's horrifying. If you love the country, you would not do this. You would also not disable our hospitals by forcing nurses to resign because they don't want to take the shot. You'll notice, by the way, in the case of the Navy SEALs and more broadly the U.S. military, that none of the members of Congress who claim to care so much about the military, they talk about it all the time, defense hawks like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and so many others, none of these people have said a single word about any of this. They have not risen to defend these guys because they don't care. But no, that would get the Democratic Party nothing. The point of mandatory vaccination is to identify the sincere Christians in the ranks, the free thinkers, the men with high testosterone levels, and anyone else who does not love Joe Biden and make them leave immediately. Psalm 1, 1 through 6, tells us the way of the righteous in the end of the ungodly. Psalm 1, 1 through 6, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. During the end times, the Bible says that wickedness and evil will run rampant all over the world. Jesus warned that by resisting these things that Christians would be hated by all nations. Jesus said the world hated him first so that we should expect that the world will hate us as well. Satan isn't masking his intentions anymore, is he? Battle lines are being drawn and people are choosing sides. If you know someone who doesn't know the Lord, tell them time is definitely running out for them to come to Jesus. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem says she's ready to fight the Biden administration's recent federal vaccine mandate for private businesses. What President Biden is doing by these mandates coming down to businesses and employers that employ more than 100 people is unconstitutional. Uh, the Constitution clearly states that there are limited powers for the federal government and that all other powers are delegated to the states. So I will, as soon as that guidance comes out, be filing litigation and I have told the president that I would see him in court. On the topic of vaccines and science, she lowered the boom on Dr. Fauci. What's your take on Fauci? Do you think he should be fired? Well, Fauci's done a grave disservice to this country. What he has done is discredited our health officials. He's been political. He's not been consistent. He has not followed the science. Uh, therefore, his credibility is down to zero. While Noam's praise for Fauci is non-existent, it's the opposite when it comes to Texas's pro-life heartbeat law. It may be controversial, but Noam is taking a stand. Do you want to see a South Dakota law just like Texas? What's your view on, on that? Well, we reached out immediately to those who drafted and worked on the Texas law and are consulting with them on how that bill would fit in our statute as well. So yes, I think it was a fantastic win for us. She also went on the offensive on telemedicine abortions. Biden administration policy allows for women to get abortions without seeing an in-person doctor first. Her executive order did away with that in South Dakota. She says this administration has been ungodly. What they are doing and the actions they're taking um, are not biblical. 
Um, and I know they, they many times talk about being religious, um, but I think that it's really time for all of us to look at the actions of our leaders and see if they line up with the Word of God. Which leads us to the spiritual state of our nation, a stand Nome says is crucial for our nation to survive. Where do you see this uh, fight playing out in America from a spiritual standpoint? Well, we've seen our society, our culture degrade as we've removed God out of our lives and people become what they spend their time doing. I really believe that focusing on those foundational biblical principles that teach us that every life has value, every person has a purpose, uh, will recenter our kids and help us really heal this division that we see taking over our country. It's an uphill battle for sure. What they are doing and the actions they're taking um, are not biblical. Um, and I know they, they many times talk about being religious, um, but I think that it's really time for all of us to look at the actions of our leaders and see if they line up with the Word of God. The Bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Falling away is the Greek word apostasia, which means defection from the truth, properly the state, apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. The end times will include a rejection of God's word, a further falling away of an already fallen world. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith, and false teachers would rise up, as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter, 3, 15, and 16. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says, Jesus Christ is the only way. It is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out as we read in Revelation 3:14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. By looking at the news headlines of our world today, there can be no doubt we are living in the final moments before Jesus' return. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Psalm 917 The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. This morning, some of the world's largest and most iconic trees are just feet from the flames. Teams of firefighters are racing against time to save historic redwoods from a raging wildfire tearing through the Sequoia National Forest. The threat intensifying in recent days after lightning strikes ignited two uncontrollable wildfires, which merged into one massive blaze. The KPN complex fire has already torched over 23,000 acres. Firefighters struggling to get the upper hand. It's incredibly steep. The fuels are incredibly dry. All of that makes us a very difficult fire to fight very dangerous. The burn area visible from space as it closes in on the so-called giant forest, home to General Sherman, the largest tree in the world. The giant sequoia, which is over 2,000 years old and stands towering 275 feet high, almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty, has attracted tourists from around the world. The flames creeping closer, crews covered the base of its massive trunk with fire-resistant wrapping in an effort to protect it. As those once awed by the forest's beauty... Look at that! Look at that! ...now shocked by the threat of devastation. The fear is that you won't be able to see wonder in nature the way that people a hundred generations before you saw it. Officials say the fire has already burned the inside of these trees, rooted just a few hundred feet from General Sherman, and the threat not isolated. Another fire burning just 40 miles to the south has swallowed over 25,000 acres and threatens more giant sequoias. This area is no stranger to this kind of destruction. Just last year, California's Castle Fire alone incinerated 10% of the world's giant sequoia population. The wildfires that we're seeing are not natural anymore. They're amplified as a result of human choices and human activity. Now, as the flames rage, the race is on to protect these towering treasures. Burning forests, scorching heat, droughts, the melting Arctic. Extreme weather has worried most people on planet Earth, and the most frightened of all are younger generations, the ones who have their whole lives to see dramatic forecasts unfold. 
The study published in The Lancet shows people aged 16 to 25 are now increasingly anxious. Among their most common beliefs, the future is frightening, humanity is doomed. Four out of ten say they hesitate to even have children. The study warns that all this fear could have serious consequences on this generation's mental health. It says anxiety is exacerbated by the fact governments have failed to deliver on their promises. A feeling summarized by climate activist Greta Thunberg. You say, just leave this to us. We will fix this. We promise we won't let you down. Don't be so pessimistic. And then, nothing. Let's talk about Madagascar and why people there are starving. In parts of the country, they're eating locusts, leaves, clay, or even bits of shoe leather just to survive. And what's going on in Madagascar is also something new. Madagascar right now is the only place in the world to be affected by famine-like conditions because of climate change. Southern Madagascar has barely had any rain in the last five years. Rivers have dried up, there's not enough water to drink, let alone to grow food. So why is climate change affecting Madagascar so badly? Why are so many people going hungry? And is this kind of thing about to get much more common? It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven-year tribulation, in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6, 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. When the fifth seal is broken, those who have been slain for the word of God and their testimony will be given white robes and told to rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. When the sixth seal is broken, there will be a great earthquake. The sun will become black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon like blood, and the stars of heaven will fall to the earth. When the seventh seal is broken, there will be silence in heaven for about a half an hour. After seven seals are opened, seven trumpets are blown. When the first angel sounds, vegetation is struck. Hail and fire mingled with blood will be thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees and all the green grass will be burned up. When the second angel sounds, the seas are struck. Something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea, which seems to be a meteor causing a third of the sea to become blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea to die, and a third of the ships to be destroyed. When the third angel sounds, the waters are struck. A great star falls from heaven, burning like a torch on the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters become Wormwood, and many men will die from the water, because it will be made poisonous. When the fourth angel sounds, the heavens are struck. A third of the sun is struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them are darkened. A third of the day will not shine, and likewise the night. When the fifth angel sounds, Satan is cast down from heaven to release demons from the bottomless pit to torment those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. When the sixth angel sounds, 
A demonic army numbering 200 million will kill a third of mankind. Four billion people have now died at this time, equaling half of the world's population. When the seventh angel sounds, the temple of God is opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant is seen in his temple, and there are lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. After seven trumpets have sounded, seven bowls are poured out. When the first angel pours out his bowl, a foul and loathsome sore will come upon the men who have the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. When the second angel pours out his bowl on the sea, it will become blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea will die. When the third angel pours out his bowl, the rivers and springs of water will become blood. When the fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun, power is given to him to scorch men with fire, and men are scorched with great heat. When the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, his kingdom becomes full of darkness, and they will gnaw their tongues because of the pain. When the sixth angel pours out his bowl, it results in the Euphrates River being dried up and the armies of the Antichrist being gathered together to wage the battle of Armageddon. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl, a loud voice comes out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. A devastating earthquake flattening everything on planet earth followed by giant hailstones weighing 100 pounds each completes the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. God's judgment against this wicked and unrepentant world will leave no doubt as to his wrath against sin. Yet there will still be people blaspheming God and not repenting and giving him glory. Revelation 16.9 And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Revelation 16.21 And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail since that plague was exceedingly great. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead, who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is your name written in the book of life? If not, I pray you get that done today, as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised them from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, Salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing, regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. 
For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 519 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12.13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. 
You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. God, what if his appearance occurs?